Yeah, I see most people are all logged on. Well, thank you for um, joining us for the meeting tonight. We have uh, John Callender here, and this meeting is going to be recorded, so you'll be able to view it at another time. Um, if for some reason the participants, if you see that you're unmuted, um, just a reminder to um, mute yourselves. And you can use the chat function at any time to um, ask questions. And in the end, we'll go over um, Q and A. And to introduce John, I will pass it to Janice for a minute. Uh, Janice for a minute. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our program on the Carpentaria Snowy Plovers. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, we've seen some previews of what you're gonna see and there's some pretty cute photos and film in here. So uh, um, announcements. Um, first off is the Santa Barbara Christmas bird count will be on January 1st and the compilation will be held via Zoom. Uh, there will be no compilation dinner. Uh, and for details, uh, you need to go to our website at santabarbaraaudubon.org backslash Santa Barbara Christmas bird count backslash reminders. And that'll give details on um, the, the day's doings. Um, second, our newsletter is in process. Um, for those of you who received the paper version, uh, your copy might be delayed uh, because there's a paper shortage and our printer is working on getting us paper as we speak. Um, so just keep a lookout for it, it'll, it'll get to you. Um, third, um, we have a, had a request from Stephanie Little. She's the Regional Director for National Audubon Society's uh, Pacific South Region and she's an active board member of Morro Coast Audubon. Uh, she's asked if we know of anybody who has a lot of hummingbird feeders in their yard, maybe somebody who lives near the uh, Elwood Monarch Butterfly Grove. Uh, she's working with a crew filming monarchs, and they have asked if there was a place where they could see a lot of hummingbirds. So if you know of anybody, please contact me and I'll put you in touch with Stephanie. Um, and finally, most importantly, uh, many thanks to all of you who have uh, responded to our annual appear, appeal uh, for year-end donations. Um, it's been, the response has been uh, really encouraging so far. We're so thankful to you uh, for your support. We and the birds are stronger because of you. So thank you. And now I'll turn it back over to Aaron and, uh, uh, to Aaron and Emily. Thank you, Janice. So, um, so we'll uh, introduce the program speaker for, oh, am I muted? No, you're good. Okay, <laughs> sorry. The program speaker for the night is John Callender. We have a exciting news, most birders probably know, but in uh, Carpinteria, the first successful breeding of snowy plovers in 60 years. And they're a federally listed threatened species. Um, and the major threat to disturbance. Uh, their sandy breach, beach breeding habitat is due to human use, and especially in uh, Southern California um, during their nesting season, March through September is their, their breeding period, and it has led to many historic nesting sites being abandoned. And although snowy plovers previously bred at Carpentria State Beach, uh, the birds have not done so since 1960. And in this talk, John will share the story of successful nesting by snowy plovers in Carpentria in 2021. And as Jana said, he'll share photos and videos of the birds. And at the end, we'll have a discussion with Q&A. And this is presented by uh, John Callender, and he's a computer programmer who lives in Carpentria. He's been a bird watcher since childhood and in recent years has focused mostly in Santa Barbara County birding. And he's the founder of Carpentria Bird Watchers, uh, current uh, organizer of uh, the Carpentria Christmas Bird Count and the program chair of the upcoming Carpentria Living Shore Festival. And with that, I'll hand it over to John. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Emily. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
share my screen so we can see plovers because they're more fun to look at than me. Uh, let's see if this works. So if I've done this correctly, you should be seeing a couple of plovers. All right, excellent. So uh, yeah, uh, as Emily explained, uh, this past summer, uh, snowy plovers nested successfully on Carpinteria State Beach, and they had not nested at that location successfully in 60 years. So it was very exciting. Uh, and I just wanted to take you through and kind of share a little bit of the story about them. And I'm going to tell the story, particularly in, in reference to these two birds on the screen uh, you see right now, because they're, they're banded. We know a little bit about their history, and we can kind of follow the events of their lives. Uh, and I just, I think it's really cool. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, PAYB. And to tell the story of that snowy plover, uh, we actually start at Coal Oil Point. And, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about the program at Coal Oil Point. I know a lot of you here are actually participants in it. There's, you know, you volunteer out there or you, you bird there a lot. Um, but this is the site where the first really significant uh, successful reestablishment of snowy plover breeding on a, a California beach happened. And so it's, it's a really impressive program. Uh, and, you know, there's, I think, an average of 30 plovers or so a year, 30, 30 plovers being fledged from there a year, or maybe it's 30 nests. I, I'm vague on the details. Again, I'm not really going to talk about coal oil point, um, but it's a big success. And it's, it's always fun to go there and see those plovers there. Uh, but in talking about PAYB, um, I want to talk about this one event that happened. So back in July of 2019, uh, there was a really high tide. And the reserve director, Chris Sandoval, in the residence there, uh, you know, looked out in the night and saw water over the, the mouth of Devereaux Slough there. And she knew that there were plover nests there. So this was a big problem that the, the waves were washing over the plover nests. Uh, so she rushed out there. She was able to collect 14 eggs that were kind of rolling around at the, the edge of the surf, um, kept them warm and got them to the, the uh, Santa Barbara Zoo's snowy plover rearing program in the morning. Uh, 13 of those plovers eventually did uh, hatch and successfully fledge. And one of them was banded PAYB. Uh, so I first encountered that bird uh, a few months later and didn't know her backstory at the time. I was just, uh, I was out birding uh, near the mouth of Carpinteria Creek along the beach there and I had a new camera. I was, you know, learning about bird photography and excited to, to snap photos of anything that would hold still. And, and this bird was actually pretty, uh, I guess the term I've heard some, but like Nick Lethaby likes to say that he was confiding. This was a confiding bird. It sort of, it hung out and let me take pictures fairly close, which, you know, knowing what I know now about her history, maybe reflects the fact that she was reared in a, in a program at the zoo, although I know they, they try to limit human contact there. Anyway, she let me take some close-up photos, and I was really excited about that. And um, it's just a really colorful bird with the, the, you know, the color bands on the legs, um, and then this magenta dye on the head. And, you know, I'm anthropomorphizing, but I just, I thought it was cool looking. I thought, oh, she's like, you know, a punk rock chick. Well, I didn't know she was a female at the time, but I thought it was a cool little colorful thing that she had going on. Uh, but this is PAYB. And uh, so if you are a fan of snowy plovers, you refer to them by the banded ones by the color combination. So this allows you to, you know, recover, uh, to, to report sightings of snowy plovers based on the color bands without having to recapture them. So you go left leg, uh, top to bottom, and then right leg top to bottom. So it's pink over aqua, the light blue is, is A for aqua, uh, and then YB for yellow over blue. So PAYB is, is this plover's name in banding terms. Um, so she came back in uh, the, uh, let's see, in the spring of, of the, the, the next spring. So I saw her in the fall of 2019. The spring of 2020, she came back and she actually nested on Carpinteria State Beach, right there by the mouth of Carpinteria Creek. Um, and uh, this is uh, April Randall, I believe. I don't know these people too well. I've, I've run into them subsequently and looking at the plovers out there. Uh, but they're putting an exclosure, an anti-predator exclosure over the nest. 
And this is something they do a lot of at Coal Oil Point as well. It's very helpful with these, uh, the Snowy Plover re Recovery Program. They can dramatically increase the chances that the eggs will make it to hatching if they put these, these cages over the, the nest. The adult plovers just walk in and out. They don't mind it at all, but it tends to keep the gulls and the you know, raccoons and skunks and whatever from getting in there and eating the eggs. So it's very helpful for that purpose. Um, just to give you kind of an orientation, if you're not as familiar with, with the carp beaches. Uh, so this is a, you know, an aerial view. If you come into Carpinteria to go to the beach, you probably come down Linden Avenue, which if you can see my cursor, it comes down this way. Uh, this is where a lot of the, the public use of the beach happens. Um, and then if you go east along the beach, this is the Carpinteria State Beach Campground. This is the mouth of Carpinteria Creek right here. And then the site that the plover nested is right about here. So there's just a little bit of a wider beach there. Um, and the other thing that may have been going on that, that caused this plover to attempt to nest there after they hadn't nested there in 60 years, uh, it had been a long time since the plover nested at that location, uh, is that in the spring of 2020, a pandemic happened and they actually closed the Carpinteria State Beach Campground. So there was, uh, people were still coming to the beach a lot, but there was a lot less use of this part of the beach. So it was a little quieter and that may have made a, a difference in terms of the bird choosing to nest there. Unfortunately, uh, that nest was destroyed by a high tide event. And it's kind of ironic. This is the same bird that you know was rescued after her egg was washed out of a nest uh, the year before. And you know her first nesting attempt had the same fate. Um, you know, the, the beach is a very dynamic environment. Plovers try and nest and raise their young there, but it doesn't always work out. And in this case, the nest was a little too close to the water. Uh, but we're not done with PAYB. PAYB will occur later in this, in this story. Uh, but now we're going to switch and talk about a different plover, NWRB. And to talk about her, I need to talk about the, the sort of Western beaches in Santa Barbara County, because her story starts out there. Um, you know, this is a, a less accessible part of the, the county if you're just a you know, a birder looking to, to go see what's happening on the beach. Uh, there's, there's less human uses of the beach because it's, you know, part of Annenberg Air Force Base and there's restricted access to it. Um, and it is one of the, the, the strongholds of snowy plover nesting in California. There's a lot of snowy plover nesting happening out there, which is a good thing. Uh, this particular stretch of beach you can get at as a, just a, you know, birder without a, a base pass. Um, if you come out Ocean Avenue from Lompoc, you end up out here, you can go to Ocean Beach Park, which has great birding. It's one of my favorite places to go birding in, in Santa Barbara County. And then over here, the Lompoc Surf train station, which is really just like a siding and a parking lot, um, you can cross over. And during the snowy plover nesting season, the beach is closed to public access here at Ocean Beach Park, but you can still come down to the beach. There's a little area that's kept open here. And so you can go down there and you can see the nesting snowy plovers there. And this section of beach is surf north, I think, uh, in the, uh, the, the surveys that the, the plover researchers do for the plovers nesting in this area. And in fact, uh, in 2013, so going back quite a ways in plover terms, uh, a bird hatched there that was banded NWRB. So that's uh, brown over white on the left leg. The N is for brown because B is blue. So uh, brown over white and then red over blue on the right leg. Uh, and this was a female bird, uh, you know, banded in 2013 as a chick. Uh, I had some other correspondence from Jamie Miller, who I think is in the meeting. Uh, but she uh, let me know that, yeah, this was a, uh, a nest with, with three eggs, as is typical, two of which fledged. And one of those uh, fledglings uh, was NWRB. And then this is a line from a report in 2016 uh, that talks about her as a suspected breeder there at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So a few years later, she's, she's breeding successfully out on the beaches of, of Vandenberg. And then uh, this past spring, she nested on Carpinteria State Beach. So basically pretty close to the same spot where uh, PAYB uh, had a nest that got washed out. The, the following spring, this bird nested there. Uh, here's the bird with her predator, anti-predator exposure over the nest. She's on the nest there. 
Uh, at first, it wasn't, we, we didn't really know for sure uh, what her band combination was because the bands were pretty old and faded. Um, but eventually, uh, when she was off the nest, we, you know, some, some good photos were obtained and we were able to determine, no, it's, it's brown over white, red over blue. Um, and this is actually really cool. This is a really old plover by plover standards. Like I think the, the oldest snowy plover known uh, was about 15 years old. Uh, but the average lifespan of a snowy, of a banded snowy plover, you know, that they can actually keep track of that is about three years. So this is an eight-year-old bird nesting on the beach down there. So she's definitely experienced, knew what she was doing, uh, made her nest a little higher up on the beach, which is helpful, it turns out, because it did not get washed away. Uh, here is the, her mate, the, the male bird. He was unbanded, so we don't really know much about his history. Um, so the nest was discovered, I want to say, on May 9th or 10th, right around there. Um, and snowy plover uh, nesting, you know, it's a kind of drawn out process. It takes them about two months to go from laying the eggs to the chicks being able to fly and, and kind of leave the nest location. So that's a long span of time. Um, and I don't know, I was, I was excited about these plovers nesting there because I knew the history and like, oh, they haven't nested there successfully in such a long time. Um, but I was also concerned because it's a pretty busy section of beach and I didn't know how good their chances were. Um, this is the view from the nest site kind of on a busy summer weekend or, you know, at the time the nesting was happening. And there's just a lot of human activity going on on that beach and, and I was concerned. Uh, so I'm actually gonna take a, a little step back and talk about what the story is with these plovers, why they're threatened, why they have uh, difficulty breeding successfully on, on Southern California beaches these days. Um, here's the, a range map from the All About Birds website. Hopefully they're okay with my repurposing it for this reason. Um, but it shows you that snowy plovers, uh, they do breed in, in some areas in the middle of the country, like some alkali lakes, you know, places with brine flies and things like that. Uh, but then those birds that breed in the middle part of the country come to the coast for the winter. And then there's this purple area along the coast here. And that's year round. Uh, you know, the, the plovers are there, they winter there, they breed there. Um, and it's this west coast population of the snowy plovers that, that are really a concern lately. Uh, so historically, as I said, they bred in a lot of different locations up and down the Pacific coast. Uh, around 1980 is when people started to get concerned and said, hey, what's going on with these plovers? They didn't have really good data on numbers going back prior to that. Like they hadn't done, you know, they weren't doing population Census, censusing of, of snowy plovers in the, the early 20th century. But what they did know is that there were a lot of nesting sites where they had been, where they were no longer nesting. Like they had occurred and bred on lots of beaches where they weren't breeding anymore. And this was especially uh, the case in Southern California where you know basically half of the, the nesting sites for snowy plovers were not being nested in at that point. Um, and once they started paying close attention to their numbers, they also saw that the population was dropping pretty dramatically. So a 20% reduction in the, the breeding population in just 15 years, you know, which if you do the math, if something doesn't change, you're looking at like 75 years and there are no more plovers. So that's a definitely a big concern. Um, and as of 2000, fewer than 1500 breeding plovers along the US West Coast. So not a big population. And again, headed in the wrong direction. They were um, listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act by the Fish and Wildlife Service in 1993, a recovery plan published in 2001, and basically with a goal of restoring a breeding population of 3000 birds along the West Coast. And as part of that, a lot of research and monitoring and, and active interventions have been done. Uh, the, the whole program at Coal Oil Point is, is part of that recovery program for the snowy plover. Um, some of that research that they've done, you know, I'm not going to go into detail on it, but you can Google this stuff and you can read it and it's very interesting. Uh, I'm just going to maybe summarize quickly what is it that's causing this problem for the snowy plovers. 
Uh, and basically it's that, you know, they use that sandy beach habitat and especially in the latter part of the 20th century, um, that sandy beach habitat has become very popular with human beings and we use it, you know, for recreation. Uh, some of it's been lost due to development. And, you know, if you have lots of people running around playing Frisbee, walking their dogs, walking their dogs off leash on a beach, it really impacts the plovers. It, it stresses them, it causes them to fly, it causes them to have to move around when they should be, you know, feeding and resting. So it's a, it's a problem for them. Uh, another big impact is beach grooming. So as part of making beaches uh, nicer for, for human beachgoers, we have uh, developed this practice on a lot of beaches of, of grooming the beach, of raking up all that unsightly kelp that washes up on the beach. And, and forms rack, the, the washed up kelp that produces populations of kelp flies, like you can see some kelp flies here and, and lots of little beach hoppers, these little uh, amphipods, like sort of relatives of, of like pill bugs and sow bugs. Um, there's a whole sandy beach ecosystem that this rack forms the, the basis of the food chain and if you go in there and rake it all up and move it all off the beach so that people can enjoy their beach recreation more, it really has the effect of converting a, a living shoreline uh, into a sterile sandbox, which you know, may look pretty, but uh, is a lot less useful for plovers. And the, the most significant, or in some ways, the most serious impact on plovers from human activity is on their breeding cycle. Um, you know, the plovers can move around in response to humans. They can find places to go. They can avoid the groomed beaches. Uh, but in order to breed successfully, uh, they, they be, they're very sensitive to that human disturbance. You know, they need a good supply of racks so that their young, when they hatch, can go and, and find things to eat. Um, and they're tied down to a location for, as I say, about two months in order to breed successfully. So, and... I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I know a lot of you are already familiar with it, but you know, plover breeding uh, biology is really pretty interesting. You know, they have precocial young, so they're cute and fluffy when they're when they hatch. They're relatively fully developed when they hatch. If you compare that to a, like a songbird, like a house finch or a mockingbird that might nest in your garden, um, the 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 songbirds, you know, the the altricial young, the less developed young. They hatch relatively, they, they lay small eggs, they hatch relatively quickly because all that, that baby bird has to do is be able to crane its head skyward and open its mouth and in response to vibrations and the parents will come along and stuff it with food and it will be able to grow rapidly. And they can minimize that whole, you know, egg laying to fledging time by using this strategy. Uh, and, and that's important because that stage in the bird's life is the the highest risk of their whole life. I mean, those baby birds are super vulnerable. Um, so you wanna minimize that time. The, the thing you have to have to use that strategy is you need to have a concealed protected nest where you can have this, this helpless altricial baby that's being fed. Snowy plovers, like a lot of ground nesting birds, they don't have that luxury. You know, Their nest is out in the open on the ground and when those eggs hatch, the babies need to be able to move. You know, they have to be able to run and hide. And, and basically the, the approach that the plovers use is they lay a very large egg. It's one of the largest eggs relative to the size of the bird, uh, of any birds. Um, they lay typically three, these relatively large eggs. They incubate them for a long time, they incubate them for about 28 days. Uh, and what that gets them is when the eggs hatch, they're relatively developed. This, this baby plover in this image is only a few days old uh, and they hatch and they can start running around pretty much right away. They feed themselves, the parents don't feed them. Uh, the, the parents will, will keep them warm. Maybe they'll, they'll brood them or they'll help protect them. Uh, they'll, they'll draw other things, you know, predators away from them if they can. But the chicks are kind of on their own as far as feeding, so they, they need to have, and that, that takes time, right? For the first few days, they don't even gain weight. Like it takes them a while to get good enough at catching food to start feeding. Uh, and again, in a context with humans on the beach and their dogs on the beach and lots of activity, it's just a very suboptimal place to try and raise a baby plover, right? The, the plover's defense 
uh, especially in the first few weeks of life when they're most vulnerable, is just to crouch down in a depression in the sand and close its eyes and hide and just sort of, you know, trust to, to good luck and camouflage to protect it. And if people are running back and forth playing Frisbee, it doesn't end well for the plovers. So there's some real problems with human activity around nesting plovers in particular. All right, so this is why I was a little stressed at the thought of this plover nesting on Carpinteria State Beach. Uh, so we'll take this, this uh, forward and start going through time as we look at what happened with that nest. Um, Memorial Day weekend uh, was the first big year that I and a lot of people had. Well, I don't know, I don't know how much other people were afraid. The, the plover professionals seemed to be you know, fairly sanguine about all this. They, they were like, yeah, we do these things. We'll, we'll do our best to help them out. Um, I talked to uh, just Coal Oil Point Reserve and one of our carbon reader bird watchers meetings around this time. I was like, what do you think their chances are? Because I was really concerned. She's like, oh, I think they got a pretty good chance. And I was like, really? You think, okay, well. Um, so we, we did our best, uh, the, the local plover concerned people, we, uh, the, the state beach, uh, the, the state beach employees, the lifeguards, um, volunteers, in fact, a lot of the people from Santa Barbara Audubon, which was really great uh, to, to see, you know, we all kind of came out and did what we could to, to give the plovers a better chance. You can't see it too well in this image, but uh, so one of the first things that, that April did, April Randall was, uh, they put a rope line around the area where the nest was, and you can't really see it in this image, but the nest is right about there, just about 10 feet inside the rope line. And, um, you know, they left some, you know, some sand below there, so people were able to go back and forth. And again, on Memorial Day weekend, there was a lot of human activity. The, um, the, the female plover is typically the one that incubates during the day, and the male plover incubates the nest at night. And uh, on this day in particular, I remember the uh, female plover was uh, unlike PAYB, that, that first plover that had tried to nest there the year before. Um, NWRB was a pretty skittish plover. Like if you were walking by, she would stay on the nest. But if you approached the rope line or if you stopped and even just looked at her from down near the water's edge, she would be up off the nest and, and moving away. You know, she was very concerned about anything paying attention to the nest and wanted to to go into action to try and you know draw that threat away from her nest. So when this stuff was going on, there's just so many people there on Memorial Day. Um, she basically left the nest and went over to the right uh, of this photo where the um, where the mouth of Carpinteria Creek is. And the male actually came and incubated the eggs during that day. But uh, but they did okay. They kept incubating. You know they didn't abandon the nest, which was something I was lying awake and I think, are they going to abandon the nest? Like, no, they were not going to abandon the nest. They were heavily invested in this nest. Um, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit. So June 8th at 8.54, I took this photo and there's uh, NWRB on the nest inside her exposure. And then I got a text in the afternoon, like, John, John, the plover's patched. So I rushed down there. And um, this is what I saw when I got there. So this is that same day at 7.45 PM. And that's Chuck Gran, who I think gave your last month's program about the Carrizo Plains. He spent a lot of time sitting there watching that nest. So that's Chuck and Holly Lohai and Tom Bland and uh, Laurel Luby of Carpinteria Bird Watchers, local Carpinteria folks. Uh, and they're all staring at one spot. It's kind of one of those things when you, you go to a, a birding site hoping to see something and you see everybody looking in the same direction, it's like a good sign. You're like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> There's something to look at there. So I went up there. And NWRB was off the nest and she was not happy about me walking up there. She did this distraction display where she sort of skitters around and tries to, to draw my attention. Uh, but in fact, I was not deterred and I was able to observe the newly hatched baby plovers. So this is them about an hour after they hatched. There may be a third one in there, I'm not sure. Or maybe it was just two in that spot. Uh, but you see there, they're fluffy, but they're not really functional yet. It takes them a little while to get up and going. Uh, this is after the sun set that evening. So there's the, the dad and he's got a couple of babies tucked in under him. And this one probably went under him in just a few more minutes after this. So that's June 8th, the day they hatched. Here's June 9th, the next morning, all the babies under, under dad there. Uh, I label this baby's first sunrise. They're just so cute, you know, and it's blinking in the sun there. Uh, so here is the mom, NWRB, and this is the last 
uh, known sighting of this bird because she left after this. This is the last time anyone saw her. And as far as I'm aware, she has not been seen since then. Uh, but this is typical that the female plovers will leave after hatching. It's a strategy that the plovers have to, to have more uh, successful uh, breeding. The females will leave, uh, the males will take care of the, the babies and the females will go off and form a new nest with another male somewhere else. So I like to think that's what NWRB did, uh, but again, we don't know. But she was gone after that morning. Uh, here's the next day. So baby's maybe a little steadier on its feet there on day two. Here they are on day three, starting to move around pretty well. Um, and along with moving around, you know, they, they left their, well, they left the exposure right away. Uh, they left the roped off area as well. So there's this little area outside the exposure that had been roped off to give the birds a place they could, they could go when there was too much human activity. Uh, and, you know, people were requested to stay out of that area and people were very good about doing that. Um, but the plovers, you know, were out feeding in the rack and they did not stay in that roped off area. So there was a lot of potential for human plover interaction. Uh, and it was really helpful that the, the state park rangers and volunteers and the lifeguards were out there kind of pointing the plovers out to people. Um, and the, the plover people generally, the, the state park uh, biologists and the state park uh, employees, they put a lot of resources into this one nest. And I really appreciate that they did that. I think they saw it as an opportunity, you know, for public outreach. And it was this historic, you know, nesting at this site where it hadn't happened in a long time. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of effort put into keeping these birds safe. So here's one of those babies just wandering around the beach, three days old, and you know, the rangers explaining, yeah, there's a plover there, and people would not know. Like you know, you'd have to point them out for them to even realize there was a bird there. So a close up of that bird on the same day. Um, all right, so I'm going to show a few videos. At this point, I discovered that oh, my camera can take video, so it's not it's not you know. Uh, David Attenborough is not calling me saying, oh, we need your video. Uh, it's very amateurish video, but uh, I don't know, gives you a chance to see what they're like. Again, this is day three and, you know, they're out there doing their best and I'm watching and I'm rooting for them to catch those flies and catch those, those sand hoppers. Uh, there's a lot of running and pecking, but there's not a lot of catching going on yet. But there's one, caught a fly. So you know, they're getting it. Here's one with a, a sand hopper firmly in its grasp. Uh, you know, the dad was very busy uh, trying to head off threats. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm a, a fan of gulls generally, but I was very much not a fan of the gulls that like to hang out at the mouth of Carpinteria Creek during this whole time. Uh, this Western gull was just kind of wandering around and the the dad was not having any of it. I'm not sure what the plover could really do, but he was standing up to him. And yeah, the gull said, all right, I'll go over this way. Let's see, so here's 13. So this is five days old. We're getting a little better, getting the hang of it. I could watch plovers run around feeding all day, but I will keep going. Uh, one week old. Uh, and then the next day, so Libby Patton was down at the beach this day and I wasn't there, but she, she shared this photo. It's like, John, there's a banded plover down here. I was like, oh, wow, you know, did the mom, did NWRB come back? And it's like, nope, it wasn't. And if you look at the bands, it was actually PAYB. It was the same bird that had the failed nesting attempt the year before that was rescued herself when her egg got washed out by uh, Chris Sandoval at Colo Point. And uh, Jessica Nielsen up at Colo Point uh, responded and, and let me know like, yeah, actually PAYB successfully nested uh, this past year at Colo Point. So her chicks had hatched uh, just three days before this on June 13th. And then she had left, she had done that thing where the, the female leaves to try and set up a new nest. So she was down here at the site of her nest site from the previous year. You know, I don't know if she was looking to, to set up a nest there. There was no available unattached male plover to set up housekeeping with her, or she just was moving through. Uh, but it was cool. I was excited to see that she was there. You know, it, it gives me hope that maybe she'll be back again. 
let's see, we're June 16th. So yeah, <laughs> and again, those gulls, they really liked hanging out. That's over by the, the mouth of the creek. And it's not far at all from where the, the plover family is, but they seem to not really be too interested in the plovers. This is the end of the day, so the chicks are tucking in under dad. They're not great at, at thermoregulating when they're young, so they, they brood underneath the, the parent a lot. So it's like, no, really, I need to get in there. Um, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit because you know we want to get to the good part. Uh, this is all good, but this is June 29th. So this is 21 days. So this is like three weeks old. So again, it only takes them about four weeks to start flying. So at this point, the uh, baby plovers are practically as big as the dad. This is the dad kind of, again, trying to be annoying to this Hearman's gull. Trying to, I don't know if the Hearman's gull was even paying attention, but the dad was very active and agitated. Um, but you can see the babies are all, the chicks are almost as big as the dad at this point. I mean, they're still sort of fluffy and not, don't have, you know, long tail and not really that developed uh, in terms of wings and all, but, but they're getting there. Uh, so here, you can, there's a lot of wing stretching going on on the part of the chicks. They're like, you know, on some level, I think they, they are aware of the fact that flying is their, their, their goal. They really want to get to where they can be more mobile and, and be safer. So July 8th, so this is pretty far along. So this is a chick and you can see they're starting to look kind of like an adult plover at this point and they're stretching their wings, they're, you know. Oh, so I actually, I, I really wanted to get footage of one of the babies flying and this is the closest I got right there. <laughs> that little thing where it just kind of flaps its wings for one second. Uh, they did occasionally take little, at this point they were starting to take little flights, maybe a foot or two feet along the beach. Uh, but that was the best I could do in terms of video. I wasn't patient enough. Uh, and then this video from July 9th. So this is actually the last day that all three plover babies were there with their dad. This last day you could see all four plovers together. So that's one of the chicks. Again, getting a lot of wing stretching. They're definitely getting close to, to being able to fly. This was in the middle of the day, so it was pretty hot. And I think they were just sort of hiding, like they were hanging out in the shade of that rock, just trying to stay cool. That's the dad in the background to the left of that post. Um, that is again on July 9th. Uh, so the next day, July 10th, I was not there, uh, but I spoke to people who were there and they only saw two babies all day on July 10th. And a lot of times you'd go to look for the plovers and you'd see two babies and it would take you a while and you'd finally find the third one. There was one of them that seemed to be a little more independent, was kind of off in the, you know, farther away from the group. Uh, but no one saw a third baby on July 10th. I was there on July 11th. I didn't see a third baby and I was there for a while looking pretty hard. So we don't really know. I mean, this is kind of how it happens when these plovers, you know, get up to fledging. It's like, if they're not banded, which none of these uh, birds were banded, uh, you know, they leave, you don't know, you lose track of them. It's possible that that third baby fell prey to a predator or something, but I choose to believe that no, it just left. It just flew off down the beach and, and started its, its life somewhere else. Um, Two days later, I went back to just see if the plovers were there and the plovers were very much gone. And in fact, this is this was their favorite spot to hang out. And these campers had set up like five awnings all in a row and there were like 40 people hanging out in this big group. And I was like, well, okay, I guess we're we're not trying to not trying to keep away from the plovers anymore because the plovers have left. Uh, so epilogue. Oh yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, I was down birding at the mouth of Carpinteria Creek and saw some plovers and I was like excited. I always get very excited these days when I see snowy plovers down there. I mean, it's obviously not the breeding season, but it's neat to see them hanging out there. Uh, and I always check them for bands because you can report the, the banded plovers. You know, there's a, a, you can Google for information about this, but you can submit your band sightings and the plover researchers were, are very grateful and they'll tell you the, the history of the bird when you submit that. None of these were banded. And then I was about to leave and I noticed another plover kind of closer being kind of, you know, okay with my presence. And in fact, it was PAYB. So PAYB was back on the beach just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so she's there, 
maybe she'll try and breed there again next year. You can only wait and see. Uh, so just kind of summing up, I think, you know, for me, what I kind of learned from this whole experience was that the plovers will, they can coexist with people. Like it's not impossible. You know, it requires a little bit of help <laughs> on the part of people. You know, again, dogs on the beach, probably not going to work. Um, it's really helpful to have a little bit of a roped off area so they can have a place where they can get away from the people when they need to. Um, but you give them that and the plovers will do the rest, you know, and, and leave the rack on the beach, you know, don't, don't go dragging the kelp off. Um, so it was exciting. And I, you know, it makes me hopeful that, you know, this downward trend of the, the plovers can be reversed with a little bit of help from people. Uh, so that is it for my talk. Uh, I wanted to give a quick uh, mention. If you want to see more videos and more photos of these plovers, because I, I took a lot more, uh, you can find it on the birdwatchers.org website. Um, I'll just do a quick plug. The Carpinteria Christmas Count is coming up. It's on December 18th. That's the first Saturday of the count window. So if you want to get a nice warm up before your January 1st count in Santa Barbara, we're looking for people. You know, if you, you sign up quick, you can go bird at the mouth of Carpinteria Creek on, on count day. You can see if PAYB is there on count day. Uh, and that's it, except for questions. So again, thank you, everybody. And I guess I will stop my screen share so we can see each other. Thank you so much, John. That was great. <laughs> Got a couple comments that everyone enjoys the good videos and footage. And uh, yeah, keep an eye out for the banded plovers. I think um, we'll try to post the, the link that you shared at the end of your um, presentation. Uh, one question, I had the same thought in mind when you were first showing the photo of um, PAYB in the beginning when it had the magenta dye on its head, was that because it was hatched in captivity or? Uh, so, you know, Jamie Miller is in the chat and she may have uh, better, I'm almost certainly does have more information about this than I do. But, um, you know, my, what I understand is that, yeah, they use it to keep track of some of the chicks in that rearing program. Not all of them get the dye, but some of them do. So I don't know if they're using it to distinguish the origin of the chicks because they get chicks from different places brought in there. Uh, I'm not, I don't actually know, but I was told, yeah, it's, it's very temporary, you know, wears off quickly. Um, but that's all I really know about it. Okay. And you mentioned in some of your, um, that the, since the, the Carpinteria chicks weren't banded, is there a reason they weren't banded or who, who kind of gets to make the decision on? Banding? You know, I, I asked one of the the plover researchers uh, who were there uh, helping to watch over the, the, the chicks um, about that. And, and her response was, well, you know, um, I mean, banding is, uh, it's a resource intensive process and it is somewhat stressful for the birds. So, you know, they do it, um, but they, you know, I, I may be reading too much into it, but maybe it's it's like, well, when we're doing this banding, you know, you have to have specially trained people and it's a big involved production and maybe banding this one little nest of, you know, three plovers and the and the dad. I'm not sure they would even try to band the adult because banding the adults is, is still harder. You have to kind of snare them and, and with the, the little chicks, at least you can just walk up and they'll hide and you can band them real quickly. Um, but yeah, my understanding was it was just not something they had the resources for, you know, and it was, you know, again, I was very happy with all the resources they were expending on, on taking care of these birds. Uh, but maybe, you know, the banding operations at some of the, the larger breeding sites make more sense for them to have the banding happen there. Okay. Yeah, and um, had some questions kind of thinking about the future protection for a potential carp breeding, like if there could be a program like how there's docent volunteers at Colville Point, um, Carpinterias maybe can have a volunteer program or um, just fencing in general during uh, breeding season. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, official kind of uh, fencing discussion uh you know i think they did eventually take down the little fenced off area near the beach there i mean near the campground there where the nesting happened but they might put it back up uh come breeding season um i don't know uh as far as volunteers uh yeah we we did set up a little again very quick we were sort of caught flat-footed you know we didn't have time to, to really organize this this is maybe a good opportunity to organize it now in advance uh, but 
yeah, we, we had some volunteers coming out and it was very helpful. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly if, if they start, you know, if they come back and, and try to breed again, I would be interested in going down there. And, you know, it was really a positive experience. Uh, and I think a lot of you who have experience at the, the coal oil point uh, docent program probably have the same experience because I've, well, I've talked to a lot of you and, and you've told me that, that, you know, it's not so much uh, an enforcement challenge to, it's, it's more an education challenge. Like if people know about these plovers and they, you kind of point out, there is this bird, check out what it's doing. You know, it's, it's being stressed by your presence, by this rope line. Maybe if you stayed down closer to the water, you know, it would be better. Um, they're very anxious to, to help, you know, and it's, it's really rare, even the people with dogs, you know, again, if, if you, you know, have the chance to kind of just explain it to them in a positive way, uh, at least my experience has been that, that people are generally very willing to, to accommodate the birds that, you know, they can recreate in ways that are not specifically going to bother these birds uh, as much as just what they would do without really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I was considering if, if they're, since they're listed as threatened, if they did become listed as endangered species, would that then kind of up the level of, I guess, like their physical protection, like would fencing then, you know, be, be mandatory or um, I guess like required something else if, uh, yeah, I guess yeah. their population did continue to decrease, but. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've run off the edge of my expertise at this point. I mean, I know that just the threatened status is enough to trigger, you know, a lot of protection and a lot of what happens now is under that, uh, that authority under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, you know, I would very much hope that they don't become uh, endangered, that they don't move up to the, the more urgent levels of protection. Uh, but mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, that's kind of the point of, you know, identifying them and taking steps earlier is that you, you doesn't have to be as heroic an effort when they get down to where there's just, you know, a handful like happened with the condors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess one, one question I had, I was thinking, you know, the little birds a couple days old already running around trying to catch, uh, catch flies, but do the parents bring them food at all? Like, would they eat a, like dead insects if the, if the parent brought it to them? Uh, not that I saw, and my understanding is that no, they pretty much don't. Like the, I'm not sure if the parent. I mean, the chicks, you know, they they go back to the parent for protection. They go back to the parent for warmth. So it wouldn't shock me if the parents are basically hanging out in more food rich areas, and that's kind of a way that they can sort of move the chicks, you know, into into better feeding territory than they might, you know, end up in on their own. Um, that is kind of another reason why the human disturbances are an important factor in, in chick survival, uh, because the chicks get separated from the parents. You know, the chicks, you know, if, if the plovers scatter due to, you know, too much, you know, old, you know, dachshund running around, you know, having fun uh, can cause real chaos for them. Uh, you know, they need a little bit of calm. <laughs> they need a little bit of, you know, peace and quiet so they can, they can pursue their, their kelp flies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jamie provided some nice information in the chat, actually, and I, if I remember correctly, I've actually corresponded with Jamie at points, too, and I know she's very knowledgeable about the Vandenberg birds, and um, it's, I've been in this boat because I like getting out to sands at points and getting photos of banded birds, and it's pretty fun, like, you get to find out about them, so yeah, you can send them to the USGS bird banding lab, but then another website you can send them to, and I think this ultimately goes to this same website through USGS, but you can also send it to, it's in the chat, it's the Snowy Plover Band Reporting at Google Groups, and I think that's kind of all the West Coast sort of Snowy Plover managers. And then um, I think there was some questions about beach closures, and um, yeah, hi, Jamie, um, nice to reconnect, but um, beach closures, um, I kind of just know about this a little bit, like I think generally public beaches are not closed, um, for plover nesting, I mean, like at Sands or um, Carp or um, Ormond Beach down in Ventura, like Audubon societies or like reserve managers do their best to kind of in, minimize impacts. So like keep your dogs off leash or off the, or keep your dogs on leash or off the beach and kind of don't hang out. But then, I mean, there is a different kind of, John was touching on um, surf beach up at Vandenberg Air Force Base because that's a part of a military installation. Um, they have some more obligations under federal law to protect these listed species. So you do have some places that like, so, it, and it can be a bit controversial up in Lompoc that they close the beach for a stretch for plover nesting, but yeah. 
And Jamie added that that email goes directly to the band coordinators in Washington, Oregon, and California. And there was some other interesting info Jamie provided about the oldest snowy plover known. The oldest known snowy plover hatched in 2001 in Humboldt. And as far as known, it is still he is still alive. The second oldest may be a Vandenberg female from 2006. And a 2013 bird, so um, our nesting female there is a certainly old and well-experienced. Many birds are five years old or younger. So, yeah, that's pretty crazy to think of one 2001, 20 years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, we hope that, you know, NWRB may, that, that older plover that, that, that you know, the, the female that nested successfully there this year, she may come back. You know, she may be, she may be there again next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was wondering in, in springtime, um, I'm sure just the carp local community, but how, how did it get spurred off that they they noticed the nest? Did, what, did you see um, eBird posts or how are people communicating? You know, I felt, <laughs> I felt a little bit remiss, like I had actually missed the boat a little bit. Um, I found out about it because I was walking by there and saw the exclosure set up. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, there's a nest exclosure. Is there a, is there a plover in there? There is a plover in there. How exciting. Uh, that was about four or five days after, uh, I think it was April Randall is the, the state park uh, biologist who found this nest and found the one uh, that PAYB made the year before. So I don't know, but I assume she is roaming those beaches periodically, you know, looking for plovers. Uh, and she must be really good at it because it is really hard to pick them out. If, if that, you know, if that cage is not sitting over the nest, it's a very easy thing to lose track of. Um, but yeah, she found it on, again, I, I think it was uh, what, May 9th. And so, you know, I think I first came across it about four or five days later and then I kind of blew their cover and put it on eBird and started like, you know, soliciting volunteers to come hang out and, and maybe keep, keep tabs on things. Well, if anybody has any other questions, um, please don't hesitate to pop them there in the chat or something. Um, yeah, I, I'm no snowy plover expert, but I really find the dynamics interesting of like summering birds and wintering birds. And obviously you kind of educated us a bit more about that tonight because we got to see like some of the birds that are here breeding at some points or wintering also. So they're around. <laughs> yeah, and, and I should have put a disclaimer at the beginning. I don't want to misrepresent my own credentials you know I'm I'm just an enthusiastic amateur you know I've, I've learned a lot I learned a lot from the biologists who are hanging out with these plovers because I go up and you know pepper them with questions while we're watching the plovers for for an extended time uh and and you know I, and I was excited about them but yeah I'm I, I'm not the authority and and certainly if you talk to some of the people at Coal Oil Point or some of the other people involved with the plover recovery effort uh, you'll get much better answers to a lot of these questions than I can provide Do you have any more questions? Or... Yeah, I couldn't come up with that any others. I was kind of brainstorming, but as you spoke, you covered everything I was thinking of. But uh, yeah, I'll have to keep my eye out and come down to Carpinteria more often, do some beach birding. But it, it seems like, um, I don't know, it was nice to see that they had extra um, state park staff there and reminding people, like you said, it's kind of education, uh, especially when it's a bird that blends in and you know people just walk by or Maybe don't notice even you know until you saw the net or the, the fencing that was cute but um yeah i'm sure we can find volunteers if needed next well, and, uh, fingers crossed <laughs> and you know the campers who were there they were they were into it you know they were people were there for like four or five days because they're camping and it's right there and and so they were hanging out there our, our ranks of volunteers swelled with like people who were just camping on the beach and weren't even necessarily bird watchers but got mm -hmm. really taken up i mean the plovers are such good little ambassadors, you know, it's not like, you know, if you've got an endangered species that's sort of off-putting, it's probably harder to, to really, you know, gin up that, that public support. But with plovers, I mean, how could you not love that little cute bird? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, I think that's probably about it. I'm going to put the Carpinteria Bird Watchers website in there one more time if you want to get more in touch with what John's got going on there and definitely the I know for the CARP CBC, you were mentioning that. And I think you, I think I saw at one point, it's a, the same day as Ventura Audubon CBC this year, right? So you're losing some of your normal folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is the, that's the big challenge this year is that, uh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, uh, 
Christmas falls on a Saturday and that really constrains the available Saturdays. If you want to do your CBC on a Saturday, there aren't many options. I mean, like, you know, the uh, Santa Barbara count is on New Year's Day, you know, so yeah. again, that might tend to undercut some of the, the participation. Although I'm sure, you know, as always happens, the Santa Barbara count will <laughs> feed us up and take our lunch money. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not something we can really compete on the same level. Well, get out and bird everybody, whether it's a CBC or not. And thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you to John for a really awesome, interesting program. And yeah, it's, having go, being in my second go around as program chair, it was a good reminder that cute baby plover photos are always <laughs> good for a program. <laughs> yeah, thank you everybody. Thanks a lot. I you know, obviously love talking about them. So this was a great chance for me to talk about them more. Yeah, and I'll just go ahead and remind everybody about our next program. There is no program in December, so do not try to log on to Zoom um, next month. Um, do Christmas bird counting and whatever else you have planned instead. And we'll be back in January on January 26th on Zoom um, with Geronimo Castaneda. He's uh, with Audubon, California, and he'll be talking about some of their Central Valley conservation initiatives, particularly some of their rangeland projects, working with dairy farmers to try to maintain tricolored blackbird habitat. So another, another special status species. So yeah, thanks for coming out everybody. And it was a really, really good evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.